था विपुल जानी एंड एज द एग्जीक्यूटिव डायरेक्टर ऑफ कैनेडा इंडिया फाउंडेशन आई वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस फोर्थ लेक्चर इन द सी आई एफ स्पीकर सीरीज टू थाउजेंड सेवनटीन हैज बीन एन इवेंटफुल ईयर फॉर अस विद द गाला एंड द गोल्फ एंड द लेक्चर्स एंड अदर इम्पोर्टेंट इशूज एज द ईयर इज वाइंडिंग डाउन लेट एस ऑल टेक मोमेंट एंड थिंक अबाउट हाउ वी कैन प्रमोट Canadian interests in India, India's interests in Canada, and at the same time further enhance bilateral relations without compromising on our core values and beliefs. At a time when the story of India is making waves globally, we want to make sure we maximize our strengths and work on our perceived weaknesses, if any. taking everyone along and respecting diverse opinions is what india has been doing for thousands of years and it is as relevant today as it has always been the story of india tells us that there could be many stories within a story and that in india that is bharat that is hindustan it is never my way or the highway it also tells us that real vikas it also tells us <laughs> it also tells us that real vikas happens when we take everyone along not push them aside real vikas happens when we are inclusive not exclusive and i am sure real vikas will happen in bilateral relations now that we have mr vikas roop as our high commissioner it has been a pleasure working with cif and with you all and to take it forward and to introduce our speaker for tonight i would now like to invite the chair of canada india foundation the one and only mr ajit someshwar thank you um thank you for attending this function ladies and gentlemen especially your excellency uh, high commissioner to uh, to canada and uh, honorable consul general your both of you being here is means a lot to us as an organization and also to us for our speaker series events <clears throat> can india foundation as you know is a public policy organization that aims to promote indo canadian political economic people to people as well as strategic relationships we support those indo canadians who are interested in public policy development as long as they agree with our broad india canada vision and are not parochial to a group religion or sect we are very much against the divide and rule policy adopted by political parties and will continue to support individuals who have the best for canada and india at heart one of our goals is to educate canadians about the changing face of india towards this effort canada india foundation started the speaker series a year ago today is the fifth event we've had various speakers we have had tarek fatah we had president of the canadian oil producers association we had consul generals from israel as well as from india dinesh bhatia ji as well as mp ramesh sanga chair of the canada india parliamentary association they have all been our previous speakers today's speaker needs very little introduction but i shall do it anyways right his excellency vikas swarup was born in allahabad i guess uh, if the current dispensation continues for a while the name might change to prayag or prayagraj or something of that sort um but is born to a family of lawyers he did his schooling in the same city and pursued further studies at the university in psychology history and philosophy and instead of law he chose psychology history and philosophy hence he became one of the six or more suspects who became an accidental diplomatic apprentice <laughs> and is here lying abroad 
as an ambassador or high commissioner, let's say. On a serious note, Vikas Swarup became a pr prolific Indian writer and an astute diplomat who served as the official spokesperson for the Ministry of External Affairs of India and currently is the High Commissioner of India to Canada. Vikas is best known as the author of the novel Q&A, which is adapted in the film Slum, uh, to become the film Slumdog Millionaire, uh, which is the winner of the best film category in the year 2009, the Academy and Golden Globe Awards. <laughs> so from here, more books, are, more novels are expected and more inspiring stories for us to read. Actually, he's probably uh, very well known as a, as, a, as a great travel read material because his books uh, can be finished, uh, you know, started and finished in a given time because it's, it's a very fast, good read subjects. The Accidental Apprentice and Six Suspects are two of his other acclaimed novels. When I met Vikas G, what came to my mind was his positive energy, clarity of thought, composure, passion for India, and a clear understanding of what the new India and the new government stood for. I had then made up my mind that this person would be a scintillating speaker, and all of us would love to hear him speak. What could the topic be? I was given I was keen to give him a free range to exercise his artistic license rather than bind him in a mundane political or business issue. The topic we have given him is the story of India. This 10,000 year old story, I mean it's a tough topic, but I'm sure many elements of this can be found in his future books. So. I am waiting and wanting to hear his interpretation. I know it's going to be unique and thought-provoking. With these words, I would like to thank His Excellency Vikas Swarupji for accepting our invitation and would now like to invite him to the podium, Vikas Swarupji. Mr. Ajit Someshwar, Chairman and members of the board of the Canada-India Foundation, Mr. Anil Shah, National Convener of the CIF, Ambassador Dinesh Bhatia, Consul General of India in Toronto, Mr. Vipul Jani, our distinguished guests. It's a pleasure for me to be back in Toronto and to be back at a Canada India Foundation event because this is an organization that in its 10 year existence has worked with just one overarching aim, strengthening the ties of friendship between Canada and India. It has played a catalytic role in raising the profile of the vibrant Indo-Canadian community and creating greater awareness of the changing face of India. This lecture, as Mr. Someshwar just said, is part of that endeavor, bringing to a broader audience the transformative changes currently underway in India. But before I begin the story of India, let me tell you the story of how I got suckered into delivering this lecture. Basically, Vipul Jani called me up one day and said, Vikas ji, we are not getting anyone for our lecture series, so will you come and deliver the next lecture? <laughs> so I said, maybe. Now, you know, when a diplomat says yes, he means maybe. When he says maybe, he means no. And of course, if he says no, he's not a diplomat. <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum is a gentleman called Mr. Ajit Someshwar. When he hears maybe, he thinks yes. And of course, those of you in the room who know him know that it is impossible to argue with him. So before I knew it, all arrangements for my visit to Toronto had been made and even the topic had been given to me, the story of India. <laughs> so Vipul was asking me that, what will your next novel be all about? Will you be able to write a novel while you are here in Canada? I said, I don't know, but after the amount of hard work I've had to do on this particular uh, issue, if I do write a novel, it will have a murder, and the murdered person will be Mr. Someshwar. <laughs> so 
So here I am, wondering how to compress the remarkable story of the most remarkable nation on the planet in 40 minutes or so. Because I also know that if I speak any longer than that, the story of India will become the lori of India, <laughs> a lullaby, and it will put all of you to sleep. Also, I did not want to conflate the story of India with the history of India. So do not expect a history lesson beginning with the, you know, the Indus Valley Civilization, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, and all that uh, kind of, uh, all, those, uh, all those developments. Because India is not just a country, it is a concept, an idea. A very, very complex idea. An idea that emerged at the dawn of history and has been going on uninterrupted ever since the Ganga has been flowing from the Himalayas to the sea in the Bay of Bengal. That is why India is the oldest continuous civilization on the planet. That is why Mark Twain called it, called India, the cradle of the human race, the birthplace of human speech, the mother of history, the grandmother of legend, the great grandmother of tradition. And that is why I decided to focus on the broad traditions, the themes and concepts that have defined India through the millennia and the characteristics that mark out contemporary India. I think the first thing that comes to most people's minds when they think of India, now I'm not saying new India or the you know, contemporary India, but when the, the first thing that comes to most people's mind when they just think of the word India is, is spirituality. Right from the Vedic times, India has enjoyed a rich spiritual tradition. India is the only country in the world, I believe, where a naked sadhu walking on the side of the road evokes no curiosity. And he might well be carrying a cell phone. <laughs> For spirituality is embedded in the matrix of our daily life. Even a hotshot banker in Chennai may well begin his day with the Surya Namaskar and chanting of the Gayatri Mantra. For thousands of years, the seers of India devoted their entire energy to finding out the meaning of life, the very essence of existence. In the Brihadarang Upanishad, King Janak asked his guru, Yagyavalk, a fundamental question. He asked, if the sun has set, the moon has set, and the fire has gone out, by what light does a person see? And Yagyavalk answered, if the sun has set, the moon has set, and the fire has gone out, a person sees by the light of the self. In the Kathopanishad, Nachiket, a 16-year-old boy is given a boon by Lord Yam, the god of death. Now, Nachiket could have asked for anything, for riches and gold, but instead, he asked an even more fundamental question. I want to know the mystery of what comes after death. That is why Max Müller, the German scholar said, if I were asked under what sky the human mind has most fully developed some of its choicest gifts and most deeply pondered on the greatest problems of life and has found solutions, I should point to India. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson was equally impressed. In the great books of India, he said, an empire spoke to us. Nothing small or unworthy, but large, serene, consistent, the voice of an old intelligence. But it was not the empire of blood and ruin, it was the empire of the mind. From Persia to the Chinese Sea, from the icy regions of Siberia to the islands of Java and Borneo, India propagated her beliefs, her tales, and her civilization peacefully. Versions of the Indian epic Ramayana, for instance, are performed in virtually every Southeast Asian nation. And Buddhism spread from India to so many countries that it has now been described as India's export religion. As Hu Shi, the former ambassador of China to the United States put it, India conquered and dominated China culturally for 20 centuries without ever having to send a single soldier across a border. Indian spirituality gave us the science of yoga the perfect union of body, mind, and spirit, which has become a rage the world over. It also gave us the philosophy of non-violence or ahimsa. Non-violence has been one of the core tenets of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. 
the mahabharat has multiple mentions of the face of the phrase ahimsa paramo dharma which literally means non violence is the highest moral virtue in jainism non violence has been elevated to such a level that jains go out of their way so as not to hurt even small insects additionally jain monks often keep a cloth to ritually cover their mouth as a reminder not to allow violence to come even in their speech in buddhism the principle mutated from kill not to love all buddha said love all so that you may not wish to kill any this is a positive way of stating the principle of ahimsa like the jains the buddhists have also always condemned the killing of any living being in the 19th and 20th centuries prominent figures of indian spirituality such as swami vivekananda ramana maharshi and swami sivanand emphasized the importance of ahimsa but it was mahatma gandhi who elevated it to a political philosophy as his grandson arun gandhi put it gandhi provided the theoretical and practical arguments against violence and for non violence and he also bequeathed a tradition of active non violence he saw life as sacred and life as one if all life was one a bit of you was killed too if you killed another human being this is best encapsulated in gandhi's own phrase an eye for an eye ends up making the whole world blind thanks to the legacy of mahatma gandhi peace has been the guiding motto of indian foreign policy india has consistently challenged the forces of imperialism intolerance discrimination and violence and has been the largest contributor to un peacekeeping missions we believe that a world that is peaceful and prosperous where trade is free and universally agreed principles are observed and in which democracy the coexistence of civilizations and respect for human rights flourish is a world of opportunity for india and for indians to thrive just as gandhi emphasized non violence swami vivekanand emphasized the virtues of tolerance that is the other big concept which emerged out of india he recognized it as the backbone of our national existence and said that india stood for the grand idea of universal toleration he was echoing an idea that has resonated throughout indian history and philosophy the vedas dating back to 3000 years proclaim ekam sat vipra bahuda vadanti or truth is one the wise call it by many names the rigved considered the oldest similarly teaches that good thoughts come to us from all sides indian tolerance has also manifested in the country society and polity the edicts of emperor ashoka who ruled much of north and central india in the 3rd century bc are notable for their accommodation of other faiths proclaiming for instance that all religions should reside everywhere and that there should be growth in the essentials of all religions india is one of the few countries without a history of antisemitism despite the presence of a jewish community that dates back almost 2000 years sikhism is also based on the belief in the validity of all religions as the guru said ek noor te sab jag upja kaun bhale kaun mande from this one light the entire universe has welled up so who is good and who is bad kabir represented the same philosophy in the sufi tradition this is india where the azan calling the islamic faithful to prayer routinely bell blends with the chant of mantras from a hindu temple and the pealing of a cathedral bell can easily merge with the sound of the shabad kirtan from a gurudwara there have been occasional aberrations but india's broad tradition of tolerance and religious harmony has remained intact at a time when international terrorism has become the biggest threat to humanity the civilizational legacy of india can provide a new way it can be an antidote to the pernicious doctrine of a clash of civilizations in jainism there is even a philosophy called anekantvad or syadvad which maintains that we cannot claim exclusive authority on any truth all things have states and dimensions hence all truth is conditional and relative best exemplified by the parable of the five blind men each of whom felt one part of the elephant and then thought that that part was the entire elephant it therefore urges us never to make a categorical assertion to always qualify our statements with a perhaps or a maybe 
The fact that acceptance of other faiths is ingrained in India's DNA has allowed India to become the most diverse country on the planet. That is the next concept I will talk about, diversity. Nowhere on earth does humanity present itself in such a dizzying, creative burst of cultures and religions, races and tongues, variety of topography and climate. Enriched by successive waves of migration and marauders from distant lands, each one of them left an indelible imprint which was absorbed into the Indian way of life. The symbiotic relationship between host and guest cultures is well illustrated in the case of the numerically small Parsi community. The only surviving followers of Zoroastrianism in the world, the Parsis landed on the coast of Gujarat early in the 8th century AD, fleeing religious persecution in Iran. Legend has it that they sent a delegation to the local ruler, requesting permission to settle. In reply, the ruler sent a vessel filled to the brim with water, indicating that his land could not hold any more. The leader of the Parsis returned the vessel with a leaf floating on the water. So impressed was the ruler with the subtle wit and wisdom of this gesture that he relented, allowing the Parsi community to settle and thrive in India. Where else will you find a country so diverse that it has all five major human races? Virtually all the world's religions, 23 official languages, all of which can be found on our currency notes, and 22,000 dialects, a dozen different traditions of classical dance, and 300 different ways of cooking the potato. <laughs> it is another matter that the potato itself was introduced to India in the early 17th century by the Portuguese, who called it batata. Many observers have been astonished by India's survival as a pluralist state. India is merely a geographical expression, Winston Churchill once noted dismissively. It is no more a single country than the equator. What he overlooked was the essential unity underlying all that diversity. As Indians, we find unity in nationality, not in religion, caste, or creed. As subjects of the world, we find unity in humanity, not in hatred or concepts of identity and race. Put another way, and turning Michael Ignatieff's expression on its head, we are a land of belonging, not blood. If America is known as a melting pot, then India is a thali, a selection of sumptuous dishes in different bowls. Each tastes different and does not necessarily mix with the other, but they belong together on the same plate and they complement each other in making a meal a satisfying repast. So the idea of India is of one land embracing many peoples. As Shashi Tharoor says, it is the idea of a nation characterized by profound differences of caste, creed, color, culture, cuisine, conviction, costume, and custom, but can, it can still rally around a democratic consensus, namely that everyone needs to agree only on the ground rules on how to disagree. It is this consensus on how to manage without consensus that has enabled India to thrive for the last 70 years, even as it faced challenges that led many to predict its disintegration. And this brings me to another very important concept that defines India, democracy. When India became independent in 1947, it was a land of desolate poverty and pervasive social inequality. Yet even in the face of such odds, India decided to opt for a political model offering universal adult franchise and a constitution that not only safeguarded fundamental rights and freedoms, but also granted equal rights to all its citizens and ensured that there would be no discrimination on grounds of caste, creed, religion, or gender. Given the experience of almost every other post-colonial country with constitutional change, this decision was revolutionary and much ahead of its time. Let us not forget that universal suffrage came to most Western democracies only after the Industrial Revolution, which meant that the poor got the right to vote after those societies had become relatively rich. And women, do not forget, got the right to vote in the United States only in 1920. If India had not chosen to become a democracy in 1947, the history of the world would have been very different. It is because of India's choices 70 years ago that democracy has become a global norm today. Democracy, we must also remember, is a process, not just an event. The democratic spirit has to seep into its citizens. In the first general election of India in 1952, voter turnout was less than 46%. Over the 
Over the years, this has steadily increased till it hit 66.38% in the last general election of 2014. More importantly, it is the so-called lower classes who vote in much greater numbers than the middle and upper classes. They stand in the hot sun for hours to cast their vote because they know their vote makes a difference. Today, India is proud to be described as the world's largest democracy and be counted among the few countries which gained independence in the mid 20th century to have sustained an unbroken democratic tradition. 70 years of freedom have bound all Indians, rich and poor, to an unwavering commitment to democracy. When India voted in the last general election in 2014, it was the biggest democratic exercise in the history of the world. With 814 million voters who voted in 930,000 polling stations using 1.4 million electronic voting machines, because remember, our elections are entirely paperless now. 11 million police and security officers, I was just thinking that's one third the population of Canada, were needed just to supervise the elections. It is thanks to 70 years of democracy and secularism and India's civilizational roots of harmony, tolerance, mysticism, and diversity that even with having the third largest Muslim population in the world, numbering 180 million plus, less than 100 Indian Muslims have been found in the Al-Qaeda and ISIS to date. Indians have not just embraced democracy, they have been empowered by it. You can see this empowerment in the mushrooming of NGOs in the country. Today, there are more than 3 million NGOs in India which are working on everything from saving the environment to protecting the rights of laborers, street children, destitute women, and handicapped persons. In their campaigns, the NGOs have often been, often been helped by the judiciary, particularly by a unique device called public interest litigation, by which any citizen of India can petition a court to intervene in any matter where he or she feels that it is in the public interest for the court to intervene. Another vehicle available to ordinary citizens is the Right to Information Act, which came into force on the 13th of October 2005. Under the provisions of this act, any citizen may request information from any public authority, including the High Commission of India and the Consulate in Toronto, which is required to reply expeditiously or within 30 days. Of course, the Indian media remains a zealous watchdog of Indian democracy. Even as print newspapers are losing circulation and folding up around the world, in India, they continue to grow. From 5,767 in 2013 to 7,781 in 2015. And I'm talking about paid newspapers here. Their circulation has also gone up in India, from 39.1 million copies in 2006 to 62.8 million in 2016, a 60% increase for which there is no parallel in the world. On the electronic news side also, India now has 832 channels, out of which 403 are exclusive news channels, easily the maximum in the world. So you can imagine my plight when I was the official spokesperson, how many news channels I had to face uh, every time I had, a, I had a press conference. The world now takes Indian democracy virtually for granted. What excites its most about today's India is the fact that it is the fastest growing major economy. But when people talk about the emergence of India, they are not strictly correct, because it is the re-emergence of India. As Professor Paul Kennedy of Yale has shown, in 1750, India accounted for about 24.5% of world manufacturing output, a share that fell to just 1.7% by 1900, as India suffered under the yoke of British colonialism. When Britain left India in 1947, it left a society with 14% literacy, a life expectancy of 28, practically no domestic industry, and more than 90% living below what is now called the poverty line. Since then, India has traveled a long way. Today, the literacy rate is up at 79%. Average life expectancy is nearing 70 years of age, and 280 million people have been pulled out of poverty in the 21st century, that is in the last 17 years. From a time when the Great Famine of Bengal in 1943 led to the deaths of 2.1 million Indians, the India of today is the world's largest producer of milk, pulses and jute, and ranks as the second largest producer of rice, wheat, 
sugar crane, groundnut, vegetables, fruit, and cotton. We are also the largest producer of tractors and of generic drugs, the second largest producer of cement, and the world's third largest producer of steel. Household consumption has been the major driver of economic growth, accounting for 59% of India's GDP, and also insulating India from external shocks. Over the next 15 years, India's middle-class consumer market could surpass both China and the US to represent 23% of the global middle class by 2030. The Indian economy has already crossed $2.5 trillion, and India is well poised to become the third largest economy by 2030, surpassing Japan, Germany, Britain, and France. So what will be the key drivers of India's growth? I believe the answer is in the question itself, the word key, K-E-Y. The K stands for knowledge. India has always prided itself on being a center of learning and knowledge. Indian knowledge tradition can be traced back to the 5th century BC with the creation of the ancient universities of Takshila and Nalanda. Ancient India was a land of sages and seers, but also a land of scholars and scientists. Research has shown that from making the best steel in the world to advanced surgery to teaching the world to count, India was actively contributing to the field of science and technology long before modern labs were set up. As Will Durant, the famous American historian said, it is true that even across the Himalayan barrier, India has sent to the West such gifts as grammar and logic, philosophy and fables, hypnotism and chess, and above all, numerals and the decimal system. Albert Einstein also echoed the same thing when he said, we owe a lot to the Indians who taught us how to count, without which no worthwhile scientific discovery could have been made. Unfortunately, as India came under the yoke of British colonialism, we missed out on the first industrial revolution as well as the second. But we were determined not to miss the third. The early investment in technical institutes of excellence like the Indian Institutes of Technology paid off in the 1990s when India's IT boom started. Today, we have the second largest pool of scientists and engineers in the world with 800,000 engineers graduating from technical institutions across the country every year compared to less than 100,000 in the United States. Our scientists have mastered the nuclear fuel cycle and sent 33 expeditions to Antarctica. Our space program is the envy of the world, having sent an unmanned mission to the moon, successfully reaching Mars in our very first attempt, and breaking a world record by sending a record 104 satellites into space this February. We are at the cutting edge of ICT, biotechnology, and nanotechnology. We have 2.75 million software developers, 36 to 38% of the world's IT offshore talent, and 36% share in the worldwide BPO market. India has also emerged as the R&D center of the world. Last year, some 943 MNCs were in India with 1,208 research and development centers, mainly on account of the large number of engineering talent that India produces, their knowledge of English, and their lower costs in comparison to mature markets. Bangalore has emerged as the fourth largest technology cluster in the world, home to over 200 engineering colleges and has over 400 R&D centers. Most experts agree that by leveraging its strengths in human capital and ICT services, India can become a major knowledge-based economy. The second part of KEY key is enterprise. Indians are born entrepreneurs. And some people say that India's genetic code has entrepreneurship embedded in it. It is this streak that has taken millions of Indians out of India to places as distant as Suriname, Australia, and of course, Canada where they have prospered as merchants and bankers, industrialists and traders, teachers, and even politicians, especially so in Canada, where a record 21 members of parliament and four ministers, as well as the leader of the third largest party, are of Indian origin. <laughs> this entrepreneurial instinct of Indians seems to be best captured by the Hindi word jugaad which can be translated as ingenuity, finding a low-cost solution to any problem, even with limited means and resources. Famous film director Shekhar Kapoor wrote of his personal experience with Jugaad a few years ago. His Blackberry's tracker roller ball 
had become unresponsive. The official BlackBerry dealer was saying it will take at least two to three weeks to repair since he could not do without his phone for such a long period of time. He was on his way to buy a new BlackBerry phone for 30,000 rupees. That, as you know, is about 600 Canadian dollars. Along the way, he sees a hole in the wall shop in Juhu Market with a small fading sign on the top saying, cell phone reparts. There he meets a 10 year old wearing an unwashed and torn t-shirt and pajamas who says, I can fix your Blackberry. Shekhar says, no way, I'm giving my phone to you. Just then, his elder brother, who is no more than 19, walks in, looks at the Blackberry, says, I know what your problem is. It's the tracker roller bar, isn't it? So Shekhar is impressed. He gives him the phone. This guy, he takes apart the phone, puts in a replacement tracker ball, obviously a pirated part from somewhere, cleans and services the whole phone, puts it back again, gives it to Shekhar, tells him, please remember to wash your hands before you use the phone. <laughs> All in six minutes flat at a cost of 500 rupees. That's 10 Canadian dollars. <laughs> Shekhar writes, I went home having discovered the true entrepreneurship that lies at what we call the bottom of the pyramid. What can you say about two uneducated and untrained brothers aged 10 and 19 that set up a hole in the wall shop and can fix any technology that the greatest technologists in the world can throw at them? I smiled at the future of our country. If only we could learn to harness this potential. Today, the same spirit of Jugaad has led India to become the global center for low cost, high tech manufacturing or what has been described as frugal engineering. India has invented several low-cost implements that inspire management gurus across the world, such as the $30 artificial limb known the world over as the Jaipur foot, the $80 portable refrigerator by Godrej called Chotu Cool, the $24 water filter by Tata called Tata Swatch, the $30 Akash tablet developed by DataWind right here in Toronto, and of course, the cheapest car in the world, the $2,500 Tata Nano. Indian biotech firms have dramatically reduced the price of insulin injections and hepatitis B vaccines have come down from $15 a shot to just 10 cents. Similarly, the Mangalyaan mission of, to Mars cost us approximately $74 million, which is a little less than the special effects for the Hollywood space film Gravity and about just 11% of the cost NASA incurred for its latest Mars program. The spirit of enterprise has now led to a startup boom in India. Supported by a range of government initiatives, new companies are popping up all over the country, making India the third largest tech startup location globally, only behind the US and UK, and the fastest growing base of startups worldwide. We are expected to have no less than 11,000 startups in the next three years by 2020, from the current 5,200. Today, established Brands like TCS, Wipro, and Infosys have been joined by Indian unicorns like Flipkart, Ola, Paytm, and Zomato. In fact, in Fortune's 2016 unicorn list, there were seven from India. That's more than South Korea, the Netherlands, and Canada combined. But the most important statistic is that 72% of the founders are under the age of 35. And that completes the third leg of KEY youth. No one exemplifies the spirit of new India better than our youth. Gurcharan Das, in his book, India Unbound, talks about a young boy serving tea at a roadside stall to pay for his computer classes. When he asked him, what do you want to become? He answered, I want to be Bill Gay. Can you imagine this guy working on a roadside tea stall, paying for his computer classes, and his dream is to become Bill Gates? I think this answer encapsulates in many ways the soul, spirit, and outlook of the new India. This is an India defined by its youth. At a time when most developed countries are facing an aging population, India is in a demographic sweet spot with 64% of its population in the working age group and which won't peak out till approximately 2050. In Europe, by 2020, the average age is going to be 46. In Japan, 47. And even in youthful immigrant-fueled America, it will be 40. But in India, the average age will be 29. With one million people entering the labor force every month, India abounds 
with young human capital essential to driving innovation, productivity, and consumer spending over the long term. But this demographic dividend will only work in our favor if we can educate and train our young people to seize the opportunities available to them in the 21st century, opportunities that our entrepreneurs are creating. And that is exactly what the government of Prime Minister Modi is attempting. The new economy that is being created will be much more transparent, globally cost competitive, and innovation driven. The Atal Innovation Mission is creating an entrepreneurship culture by building tinkering labs in over 1,000 schools, enabling new incubation centers and scaling established ones. The Mudra program and the India Aspiration Fund will catalyze thousands of crores of investment into startups and micro, small, and medium enterprises, thus creating employment for millions. We also see a big role for foreign investment in our development efforts. In the last three years, the government has eased 87 FDI rules across 21 sectors to accelerate economic growth and boost jobs. Today, believe it or not, there are just 11 sectors left in which government's approval is needed for FDI, making India one of the most open economies in the world. This has led to a record amount of foreign investment coming into India, with a jump to $60.1 billion in 2016-17 alone. And India also jumped a record 30 spots on the World Bank's latest ease of doing business index. The goods and services tax, demonetization, and digital payments are game-changing efforts to formalize India's economy. Transactions that were taking place outside the tax net and in the informal sector are now being brought into the formal sector. Most importantly, the new economy will also be much more equitable, thereby ensuring that all Indians lead better lives. The first step to doing this is to ensure that all of India can be part of the financial and digital mainstream. And the program that is driving this inclusion is JAM. No, this is not the concoction you eat at breakfast, but the linking of Jandhan to Aadhaar to mobile. First, let me tell you about Aadhaar. When India launched the world's most ambitious digital identity program in 2009, it was seen as revolutionary. Today, it has become the largest and most successful IT project ever undertaken in the world, with enrollment of over 99% of Indians aged 18 and above. This means that a billion Indians each have the unique 12-digit number authenticated by fingerprints and retina scans. It is now being linked to the Jandhan program, the world's largest financial inclusion project, which has led to the opening of 306 million bank accounts for the unbanked poor. Now, people thought that, okay, you have opened bank accounts for these poor people, but the poor don't have any money to put into these bank accounts. These will, these will remain zero balance bank accounts. Well, think again. Guess how much money the poor put into these bank accounts? 65,697 crores. That is $10 billion. 76% of the bank accounts are now seeded. The final piece of the puzzle is linking the 1 billion bank accounts in India, which includes, of course, the 306 million new bank accounts for the poor, to the 1.17 billion mobile phone subscriptions to complete the trinity of jam. Add to this the Bheem, a mobile app that enables instant bank transactions between two banks using unified payments interface, even on non-smartphones with the USSD. And you have a secure and seamless digital payments infrastructure, which will enable all Indians, especially the poor, to access financial services, loans, and insurance, and thus obtain a cushion against life's major shocks. Now, when I tell people about JAM, you know, they see the slides, but then their eyes glaze over because they cannot comprehend what does it mean on the ground. So to understand the human impact of this social revolution, consider the plight of an Indian mother in a village. This is Shanti Devi, who has two daughters. She is eligible for a government subsidy of 2,000 rupees, that is about 40 Canadian dollars, to send her two daughters to school. Now, until, unless, um, about two years ago, in order to avail herself of these funds, she would have needed to fill out a form verifying her daughter's attendance, get that form validated by the school, then bring that form to a government office. She would then have waited as the form would have traveled up the bureaucratic chain to the point where eventually, in a good situation, in a good scenario, a check would be issued to her in the amount of her benefits. 
to collect the check, she would again have needed to travel to a government office. If there turned out to be corruption in the office, she would have needed to fork out between 50 to 20% of the total amount in cash before she could collect the check. Then, of course, she would have needed to travel all the way back to a bank to cash the check. In the end, of the 2,000 rupees that she was entitled to, she would, in a good outcome, in a good scenario, have received about 1,400 rupees, with the balance having gone to travel and corruption money. Now consider the same situation under the JAM initiative. Shanti Devi can now go to her daughter's school and use a tablet or smartphone to validate her identity using her Aadhaar number. Her eligibility for the program, because it is now linked to Aadhaar, is already seeded in the system. And her Aadhaar number is now linked to the zero balance bank account created for her under the Jandhan inclusion program. The workflow, because everything is already there, the data is already there, the workflow approves her request in a batch process. Within 24 to 48 hours, she gets an alert on her mobile phone telling her that 2,000 rupees, the full 2,000 rupees, has been transferred to her bank account. So there is no delay, there is no middleman, there is no corruption. This attempt to bring the most sophisticated technology to the most deprived has become the biggest game changer in governance in India. Now, 25 million households get their cooking gas subsidy directly into their bank accounts, simply as a consequence of having government services linked to their Aadhaar number. As with the case of the school fees, the subsidy is going to the intended beneficiaries directly, not to intermediaries. This has already resulted in savings of nearly $6 billion to the government. Two months ago, I was at an investment conference in Toronto, where I'm sure many of you were also there, which was addressed by Nandan Nilekani one of the founders of Infosys and the architect of the Aadhaar program. And he pointed out something very interesting. He said, Indians are getting data rich before getting economically rich. And that is why India is the only country in the world where data is being used to improve the lives of the people. In the West, data is being used primarily to sell to people. Think of Facebook and Google ads and the customized suggestions from Amazon based on your past purchases. I mean, I made the mistake of going to Old Navy and giving them my email, and my God, I was bombarded with five emails per day. Please come, sir, we have 10% off for you, we have 15% off for you, we have this on sale, we have that on sale, till eventually I had to say, please unsubscribe me. But in India, we have built an architecture where individuals and businesses can use their own data, can be empowered by their own data to make their lives better, to get better loans, better jobs, better health care, and better education. Another thing we are very proud of is the way in which India is leading the way on environmental issues. We are creating 175 gigawatts of renewable energy capacity by 2022, of which 100 gigawatts will be solar, thanks to the price of solar having dropped to just five Canadian cents per kilowatt hour in the last auction. We are selling 600,000 LED bulbs per day, and the government has said that by 2019, only LED bulbs will be sold in India. Even more revolutionary, we have declared that by 2030, only electric cars will be sold in India. I was in Halifax for the Halifax Security Forum and I met the former Prime Minister of Sweden, Carl Bildt, and he said, in Sweden, our target is 2040, but you are doing it 10 years ahead of even Sweden. At the Paris Agreement, India had promised that we will have a target of 40% of electricity generation through non-fossil fuel sources by 2030. We are on target to achieve this target by 2022, eight years ahead of schedule. Our first 70 years were spent in laying the foundation for a strong and stable India. The next 30 years will be defined by the interplay of knowledge, enterprise, and youth, ensuring that by 2050, India will lead the world in almost every category. It will have the largest middle class population in the world, the highest number of college graduates and patent holders, and will provide a third of the world's workforce. As a result, stereotypes about India and Indians are changing. We have gone from the image of India as a land of fakirs lying on beds of nails and snake charmers doing the Indian rope trick, to the image of India as a land of mathematical geniuses, computer wizards, and software gurus. This can sometimes have unintended consequences. An Indian history student was recently accosted at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam by an anxiously perspiring European saying, you are Indian, you are Indian, can you help me fix my laptop? <laughs> now this is an example.
of India's soft power. When hundreds assemble at Parliament Hill in Ottawa to do yoga on Wednesdays, when Germans go for an Ayurvedic detox to Kerala, when Japanese teenagers dance to the tune of Bollywood beats or Russians sing Avara Hu, when Indians' restaurants mushroom in international capitals faster than you can say curry, when traffic stops in Afghanistan to watch an Indian soap on Tolo TV, when Kiran Desai wins the Booker Prize or Manushi Chiller wins the, wins the Miss World, there is an expansion of India's soft power. I believe that India's greatest draw in today's day and age is not so much what it does as in what it is. The most extraordinary experiment in democracy, diversity, and development ever to take shape in human history. As India races to lift out of poverty its 172 million citizens who live on less than $2 a day, and tries to do so in a way that is environmentally sustainable and politically viable on a scale never before achieved, this is an experiment in which the entire democratic world has a vital stake. As Meera Kamdar says, if India succeeds, it will not only save itself, it will save us all. For as goes India, so goes the world. This then is the story of India. It is a story still being written. Perhaps the best way to sum up the story of India is to take the analogy of a river, the river Ganga. To India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, the Ganga was the river of India, a symbol of India's age-long age culture and civilization, ever-changing, ever-flowing, and yet ever the same Ganga, a memory of the past of India running into the present and flowing onto the great ocean of the future. Thank you. Can we have another round of applause for this fantastic, inspiring, oh my God. Ladies and gentlemen, I think he deserves one more round. Come on, please. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open for some question and answers first before we get into further, advance into the other issues. Yes. So. Raise your hands, raise your hands whoever, and introduce yourself before you ask your question. My name is Jasbir Singh Tello. I've recently moved from New Zealand. And uh, to start off, sir, I would like to really appreciate and you know, I'm really impressed the information you've shared with us. I, I, I already know a lot, I read a lot about India and stuff, what's happening. But today what you've told us is really eye-opening. And one question I have, which I've actually um, noticed, um, my stay in New Zealand for 11 years, and uh, that the Western media does not portray India the way it is actually. You know, they still try to portray it in a way like, you know, we are 100 years back and stuff. So what are we can, kind of doing in that regard? Like, um, I've, I've, I've been asked this question, like, do you have malls in India? Do you still have malls in India and stuff like that? So why that thing is not being promoted by the Western, in, uh, Western media? So that's my question. Look, for that, uh, first of all, you have to acknowledge that, I mean, India is the greatest country in the world as far as I'm concerned, but we do have our problems. And as you know, India also lives in several centuries at the same time. So we do have some social evils, we do have some problems, not to deny that at all. But the great thing about India is we accept that what's and all, what India is, and we are trying to make India a better place. So I think one way of doing this is for people to actually go to India. That's why we are trying to promote tourism in as big a way as possible. As you know now, almost every country in the world, we have allowed electronic visas now. You can just you know, apply online, you don't even have to go to an embassy or a consulate, and just go there and have a look and see for yourself what India is all about. But I think all of you living outside India, and as you saw in the slide, there are 30 million Indians living outside India, people of Indian origin. You have a big role to play. Because the primary vision, the primary uh, acquaintance that people have of India in a foreign country is through Indians. So when they see you, when they, see, when they speak to you, when they hear your attitudes, when they hear your impression of India, that's how their impression of India gets formed. So if the people out there, if the Indians outside India give a bad image of India, 
then the bad image of India will be created. Because look, Dinesh and I, we are transitory ambassadors. We come and we go. You are our permanent ambassadors. You are the ones who represent India since the time you have arrived. <laughs> and of course, Dinesh and I do this all the time. I mean, why did I come and address CIF even without murdering Ajit Someshwar? <laughs> it's because I believe it's my duty to tell people about the transformative changes that are taking place in India. You know, many Canadians that I speak to, they are aware, of course, everybody is aware of India. Canada is 100% literacy. Everybody knows where India is, and they know it's the world's largest democracy. But beyond that, it's totally fuzzy. They have no idea beyond that. What they know about India is what they read in the New York Times. Oh, you know, someone was lynched today, or some riot happened somewhere else, because, you know, bad news sells. The good part, you know, about the JAM initiative, very few publications will write about that, or will tell you, you know, what are the transformative changes that are happening. So that is, of course, incumbent upon us, but it is also incumbent upon people like you, that in your interactions, please continue to educate people that India is no longer the India of 1970s or 1980s or even of 1990s. This is the new India. And the biggest change in this new India is a change of mindset. The old India was an India where we were, we were so afraid of the fear of failure that you know we sort of tied ourselves up. But this is an India which is confident of success. We believe nothing is impossible. The head of Google was telling us, the head of Google India, he said, in the past, whenever I used to recruit the best engineers in the world, I just used to go to the IIT and would say, okay, this is the salary, come on, sign up. And you know, uh, 50, 60, whatever I needed, immediately all the toppers of IIT would sign up to work for Google because we would pay very well. Now he says, when I go, he says, thank you, Mr. Google, but we would rather work for ourselves. We would rather be entrepreneurs than workers. That's the big change. That is why India is becoming the third largest tech startup location globally. So this is, it's a big change of mindset. I mean, unfortunately, uh, the changes will seep into the outside world in ribs and rabs. But I think eventually that change will come. As you can see, the whole world is now making a beeline for India because of the vast Indian market. The fact that by 2030, we will probably even surpass China to become the largest market in the world. I think all those changes eventually will seep in. Uh, the business class probably knows that among the ordinary public. Gradually, uh, I think through organizations like CIF also, you also have a big responsibility you know, to document the changing face of India, to educate uh, your interlocutors about what is happening in India, and eventually I'm sure we'll get there. Sir, I have one addition to make to your statement. One of your slides you had mentioned that India has become the third largest steel producer in the world. I want to add one more fact to that. 2017, India is going to be the second largest stainless steel producer in the world, outbeating in United States and Japan. Wow, okay. There you go. Even I did not know this fact. Well, this is my business, so that's why I can say okay. that. But it has been a fact. Yeah, at the back. Please. Uh, hi, I'm Sanjay Varma. Uh, my question is uh, kind of political. So, uh, like, uh, I want to know what the foreign policy is or uh, could be comparing to what our adversaries across the Indian border are kind of coaching, you know, candidates over here to uh, kind of be, uh, become active in the political uh, this thing, arena. And uh, like, I mean, what is the uh, take of uh, the Indian foreign policy with, to counter this kind of, uh, uh, you know, circumstances of, of appearing now in Canada? No, I don't get your point because uh, okay, so uh, the Indian community is the most politically active community in, among the entire no, Indian community. No one has, has 21 members of parliament as, uh, as the Indian community no, What I mean to say, when you see the M103 motion being passed over here, you see the Sikh genocide uh, motion being passed over here. So what is our counter? Because this is not happening uh, like, I mean, an isolated incident. It is a kind of uh, development over a certain period of time. No. These are matters pertaining to internal political developments in Canada in which you as Canadian citizens have a role. I as a foreign diplomat do not have a role uh, in, in those developments. It is for uh, Indian Canadians who have uh, citizens of Canada to decide what kind of political system you need to have, what kind of issues need to be deliberated. So if you are better organized, if you uh, have a bigger voice, obviously 
your voice will be heard in a better way. It's sir, as simple as that. Sir, yeah. can I interrupt, please? Well, my suggestion was, you know, we may need May I say some something? Sort of At support. this moment, Canada sure. India Foundation has indeed taken up this particular matter. We have spoken very well about this subject in front of the parliament, in front of the provincial parliament, and we have taken it up. And we would certainly take your assistance in any matter that you can offer in this matter. All Indians are supposed to support this event because, and that's what my colleague Ajit Someshwar also mentioned earlier, that you must know your MP, who you're voting for. That is the most important thing, not the party because you must know that that MP is a friend of India and a friend of Canada. Next question, please. Oh, Girish, sorry. Let him go ahead, finish your question. Finish, finish your question. Good evening, Your Excellency. I was told that I have got a reserved seat, so I, I came here to ask the question. Girish Kekre, uh, Canadian, but with Indian heart. I think in the world, power brings you the recognition. And one thing I would like you to touch base upon about the India's defense abilities. I recently heard Prime Minister Modi mentioning that the e in the UN peacekeeping force, the number of soldiers which have been deployed is maximum by India. I would like you to just shed some light about what we are doing so that we have uh, what they call as a veto seat in the UN or uh, how we can be a superpower. This is an issue that I have dealt with in my previous avatar as Joint Secretary United Nations Political, in which capacity I also handle UN peacekeeping. Historically, if you look at it, India has been the single largest contributor to UN peacekeeping. We have participated in the vast majority of UN missions. Maximum number of soldiers who have lost their lives have been from India. Currently, we are not number one. We are, I think, number three. Uh, we have 6,000 plus Indian uh, uh, troops and police officers deployed uh, in many theaters across the world. We have, uh, for us, it is not just because we want a Security Council seat. It, for us, it's an article of faith. The United Nations was created on the ashes of the Second World War so that mankind does not have a repeat of what we saw in the Second World War, the millions of people who died. And we believe that UN peacekeeping is one of the most effective ways of keeping the peace. And you know, we only participate in UN peacekeeping missions. Unlike America and some other countries which participate in multinational missions, we only participate when there is the umbrella of the United Nations. Because for us, that is the only way of conferring legitimacy on an, on an operation. So our commitment to UN peacekeeping remains. In fact, now we, are, we have developed such good peacekeeping training abilities that we are training third country peacekeepers in our facilities. In partnership with the US, we recently organized a very successful training course for women peacekeepers. As far as the quest for a Security Council seat is concerned, I fully agree with you. I think the world community is doing itself a big disservice by keeping one-sixth of humanity out, the world's largest democracy. We believe we have all the credentials to be a permanent member of the UN Security Council. The problem is, you know, the superpowers and others have successfully divided the world on this issue. One big issue on which there is a division between the G4, which is India, Brazil, uh, Germany, and Japan, and, you know, the other group, which is the Uniting for Consensus, also known as the Coffee Club, is the power of the veto. Whether we should have the power of the veto or not. We believe that, in fact, for a compromise, we said, look, everyone should have the power of the veto, but if that is the only sticking point, we are ready to give up our power of the veto for 15 years, you know, till there is a review. But before that, we are in the Security Council, and then we can have a review on that. But the Africans are still not coming on board. And without Africa coming on board, you will never, you will, because remember, you need two-thirds majority in order to have a resolution passed asking for Security Council reform. So till we get Africa on board, unfortunately, Security Council reform will not be possible. We will continue with our quest. I think the whole world acknowledges. If you look at, if indeed there was, many people say, look, if there was just a contest for one seat and it was for India, we will immediately vote for you, but that's not the way it will be. In the, there is a particular formula that even the G4 has evolved where there'll be, you know, how many seats will be expanded and how many will go to Asia and how many will go to Africa. Africa is in the worst spot at the moment because Africa has zero representation in the Security Council. <coughs> I mean, the, as a permanent member of the Security Council, and 90% of all peacekeeping missions are now currently centered on Africa. So from that point of view, uh, their uh, dilemma is even more acute. But till I think we evolve some kind of a consensus on this issue, 
Uh, we, we tried very hard that in the 70th anniversary of the UN, when UN has turned 70 years, then at least we should have Security Council reform, but they successfully <coughs> stymied it. I suppose the next attempt will be made when the UN turns 75. But remember, the arrangement that there will be five permanent members was supposed to be a very, transit a very transitory one only for five to 10 years. But see how the great powers have successfully managed to divide the world and keep their uh, prestige and privilege going. But very recently, I don't know if you followed this or not, there was a straight contest between an Indian judge and a UK judge yeah. for a position on the International Court of Justice. And the rule is that only that person will win who gets a majority in both the General Assembly and in the Security Council. In the Security Council, because UK is a permanent member, their judge had nine and our judge had six because total 15 is the strength of the Security Council. But in the General Assembly, we had 120 plus and he had 60, uh, 63 or something like that. And seven, eight rounds of voting happened and our numbers in the GA kept on increasing. Till eventually they recognized that look, uh, you know, you cannot stand against the will of the majority and the UK judge withdrew and the Indian judge, uh, you know, got his wow. uh, rightful share. So this, in a sense, is a sign of the times. It tells you the power balance is shifting. Very good. Next question. Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Parthi Khandavo. I'm a trustee on the Toronto District School Board. Um, many of us in the room felt disappointment with uh, uh, one of the motions coming out of Queen's Park and one of the reasons why I'm now running uh, to, to become a member of the Ontario Parliament. And uh, my question, though seemingly political, is um, a social, cultural one. Um, following that motion, there's been a lot of discussion internally in the community on how to be more effective politically. Um, that discussion has generally centered around do we organize as secular Indians or as a Hindu community? I'm looking, though seemingly black and white, I'm not looking for a yes or no answer. I'm looking perhaps for texture, context to your thoughts. When I look at the presentation, a lot of the virtue, the good that has spanned Bharat's history has come from Sanatana Dharma, from Vedic thinking, Hindu faith. Given that great intersection between what is Indian and what is Hindu, I would imagine there's more value to organizing around faith than a secular identity. What are your thoughts from a social, cultural lens to aid this conversation on how we organize to be effective in Canada? Look, again, uh, I'll hark back to the answer I gave earlier. This is an internal political issue here which has to be resolved by the Indian community here. I mean, we can only provide overall, you know, a sense of what's happening in India. I mean, we expressed our very severe disappointment with that motion, which was passed on the 6th of April in, uh, in the Ontario Legislative Assembly. We believe it's a complete travesty of, uh, of the reality. And not just what it talked about, what happened in 1984, but even before that, the kind of language that was used, you know, discrimination, violence, prejudice, hostility, hatred, as if, you know, India is the worst country in the world. So we were extremely disappointed. We have made our disappointment very, very clear, not only to the Premier here, but to uh, other members of the assembly also, as also to the federal government. Eventually, I think this is a question that the Indian community needs to ponder over. What is the kind of image that you would like the Canadian political spectrum to have of India? And how do you counter negative impressions of India? Because remember, eventually, you know, the idea of India is an idea that we all need to protect. Because if the idea of India is destroyed, that India is a land you know, which encompasses everyone, which is a land which does not exclude anyone. It is an all-inclusive. The Indian identity itself is an identity which has been developed across the millennia. You cannot say that there is a one pure uh, identity that we have, whatever, you know, the food that we eat came to us from the Mughals, uh, the music uh, came from somewhere else, some of our art came from the Greeks. So it's a composite identity. Here also, the last thing you want is that there should be a schism between you know, one section of the community and another section of the community. Eventually, all of you are in there as persons of Indian origin. And I think that is the point which I make, that when a motion of this kind is passed, it's not that one community can exult, oh, ji, ji, humne ye karwa diya. 
the brand identity of everyone as a person of Indian origin is diluted. That is the point that we have to recognize. Because remember, we may change the color of our passport, but we cannot change the colors of our skin. When you go to an immigration counter, and before you whip out your passport, he looks at you from the lens of which, which is the area you are coming from. You can say, I'm American, I'm Australian, I'm Canadian. You know, the kind of questions that will be asked will still hark back. I think the world has to evolve when we go beyond skin color and start looking at people in a, uh, through a different lens. So look at this always, that even those who managed to get this motion passed, is their brand identity as Indians or persons of Indian origin increased as a result of that or has it decreased? Look at it from that lens. That is the only pointer I will give. Beyond that, it is not right or politic for me as the Indian High Commissioner here to talk about an internal political... Very well said, sir. In Very well said. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Your Ex Excellency. And I just want to say that was a fantastic presentation. And being the only Chinese in the room, I like, at least I like to think I am. <laughs> thank you. And, uh, my name is Karen Lin, and I am a political lobbyist and work very closely with the provincial government in Ontario, specialized in government relations. And I've been paying uh, very close attention to your presentation. Several points that you mentioned that India is going to be the largest uh, middle class by 2030 and the largest exporter of uh, resources, uh, stainless steels and all the bouts and whistles. What I'm curious to or at least I would like to understand is, how do you actually foresee um, the relationship, or rather the bilateral relationship between China and India, given that um, a recent Pew Research has conducted that 27% of Indians view China positively, 35% of India uh, view as negatively, by us I mean you know, people who are actually from China, I was born here. Um, so my question is, in this sort of, I guess, the two countries are sort of in a competitive, dynamic relationship. How do you view that relationship going forward? And, you know, given that we've had very unfortunate incidents at the border uh, in Doklam, and uh, that was resolved peacefully, and my sense is that further dispute, whether uh, along the Tibetan border or in the southern China Sea will happen, but that will eventually get resolved, and we have some shared uh, interest in the UN, and we also have some points of contention. So in your mind, I guess nobody can see that far, that both countries are trying to sort of vying for an important spot globally. How do you perceive that sort of relationship? And where do you see that both countries, or rather both communities in Canada can benefit and help lifting each other up? Right. Look, uh, there is no doubt at all that the rise of China in modern times is one of the most significant developments uh, in geopolitics in the history of the world. There is no doubt about it. The kind of the progress that China has made the number of millions of people it has lifted out of poverty, the uh, significant strides it has made in all kinds of technology is really remarkable. We believe that the world is large enough to accommodate the peaceful rise of both China and India. Obviously, we would like to have a very cooperative, a very positive relationship with China. China is our number one trading partner. Our trade, uh, you know, last year was $71 billion. But unfortunately, it's a very one-sided trade. We have a $48 billion trade deficit with China. As you rightly said, we also have uh, certain issues with China. We have an unresolved border, uh, border issue. We recently had a border uh, standoff. But look at the maturity of the relationship now that we can even resolve a 73-day 73, 73 standoff in a peaceful way. And you know, the India-China border is one of the longest borders in the world. But as Prime Minister Modi has said, for the last 30 years, not a single bullet has been fired across that border. So, we, so, so that, we would like to keep it that way. We would like uh, the relationship between India and China to be a peaceful one. We would like, of course, our relations to be a cooperative one because, as you also said, there are many areas in which we have a convergent viewpoint. You know, we also, uh, I think, on environment issues, India and China are leading the way after the withdrawal of the U.S. from the Paris Agreement. On WTO issues, I think India and China see eye to eye. So there are many areas of convergence, but let us not also forget that there are many areas of divergence. And Prime Minister Modi was very clear that the India-China relationship cannot really make, you know, incremental progress or very fast progress unless we also sit down and resolve the thorny issues which have clouded the relationship since 1962. So I think we need to look at that as well. And I believe, uh, I am personally confident that uh, the peaceful rise of both India and China 
will be accommodated, can be accommodated, and eventually India and China will together propel the global economy. Thank you. We're going to take five more questions, please. One more. Hang up. Very good evening, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is uh, My name is Rakesh Ori. Uh, Rakesh Ori. Thank you. My name is Rakesh Ori. And first of all, I am very much impressed in the way you presented it. And we have also been a long association uh, with the Indian Business Association uh, community, both in uh, Moscow, Russia, as well as uh, we are also coming over to this place too. Uh, well, uh, the brand establishment or the equity of uh, uh, India is very strong, which you rightly said by you, that avara hume, avara hume, people still dance, start dancing and remember uh, something like of uh, a Kapoor family or Miranam Joker. Of course, apart from Tanduri Murga, when you take it to India, you know. Sir, so can you get so to strong. the question, please? My question, my question is, since we are from pharmaceutical line too, and uh, the, the awareness of the natural products, as well as the pharmaceutical product, both, is too much over here. Are we doing something especially to explore or maybe inviting some delegates from India to this place or taking a delegate from Canada to India in order to bring more awareness and they are interested especially to have a joint venture in Canada? Look, as far as pharmaceutical, uh, there are Thank two you. fields in which India is a world leader. One is IT and the right. other is pharmaceuticals. We are the world's largest supplier, the largest producer of generic drugs in the world. There is no doubt about it. And Indian generic drugs have proven that, you know, they are world beaters, that it's not just reverse engineering, but it's really quality products. There you are. Mr. Chothai is uh, involved no, no. in that uh, business uh, himself, so he knows. And I think as healthcare okay. costs continue to rise globally, you know, more and more countries will have to, uh, I think, take the route of the Indian uh, generic drug uh, market because that is the only way in which you can ensure that costs are reduced and quality is maintained. Today, Africa would have completely gone down under with AIDS if it was not for Indian antiretrovirals, which you know are the lifeline of people in Africa. Because if they had bought from Pfizer and uh, you know, the other uh, multinationals, uh, they would just not have been able to afford it. It's the Ranbaxis of the world that really provided the cheap uh, antiretrovirals, which are the lifeline for Africa. So I, I like think on the, on the drug side, the partnerships between India and the rest of the world will continue to increase, and we will continue to innovate and come up with even better and better products. I could add one more thing, sir, to His Excellency's comment. Canada India Foundation had a health forum here in Canada, exactly. and we also had a health forum in India Thanks to Dr. Lucky Lakshmanan, who happens to be sitting at the back here. Lucky, please. You might want to talk to him. Because this is where the collaboration between Canada and India would come. And of course, Mr. Chotai here is a co-chair, always been. Mr. Chair. Sorry. Next yeah. question, uh, please. So my name is Rajiv Nayan, and I come from Bihar. And my question is very specific to what you said, key, and very specific on the knowledge part. I think uh, I believe personally where I am today because of my knowledge and education I went through. And when I see the primary education, at least from coming from Bihar, UP, that part of the world, uh, region in India, maybe Bengal, and you know, going east of Delhi if you go, what is your take? What is the government philosophy or policy? Because at least I am reading too much. Everything what you talked about, I'm very much aware of that. But I don't get a sense how fast and furious the government is, and not only this government, as a philosophy, as a country, to fundamentally start changing the primary education system which breeds the new generation. And is it even doable in the current context, or is there a focus to do that? That would be my question. No, I think that's the, you have really hit the nail on the head. Uh, Prime Minister Modi started a lecture series uh, with the Niti Aayog, a Niti Aayog lecture series, and the first speaker that he invited for that was the Vice Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Shanmugam. And he, in his speech, he said that if there's one thing that has failed India, it is the primary education system. Because you, we still have so much of teacher absenteeism, we still have many students who are not coming to, uh, despite the midday meal program, etc. He says that has been the single biggest failure of India. Because if you look at the rise of any country in the world, you look at Japan, you look at Korea, earlier you look at USA, UK, they all have become developed economies 
because everybody had an equal chance, everybody had a quality education. So for me, that is the fundamental thing. Unless you can educate your youngsters, how can you make them into proper citizens and you know, entrepreneurs or uh, businessmen or doctors or whatever. Uh, and this is the problem. In India, you have this double track system where even the rickshawala is saving money and trying to send his kid to a private school so that you know, uh, he can get a better break in life. But the government is aware of this. I think uh, increasingly, don't forget also that education in India is a concurrent subject. It is largely a, s a state subject. It is for every state has their own state boards. Then the center has the CBSE systems and you know, they are a parallel system where some people can go to a central school and some can go to a state school depending on where you want to go. So I think uh, already a commission is sitting on this to develop a national curriculum. The government is very, very clear that unless we fix the primary school system, India cannot meet the, I mean, can, cannot gain from the demographic dividend that we are going to have. And that is why I think you will see more and more emphasis now on fixing the education system. Not just the primary one, but also the tertiary one and the secondary one and the university one. In all of them, uh, you will see really focused interventions now. Uh, as the economy also gathers steam, we will, uh, the social infrastructure, before we fix the physical infrastructure, I think the social infrastructure needs to be fixed. Education is a part of that. We are cognizant of this, of this challenge. Very good. Surjit, please. please. Please have a seat, please. Uh, you'll get good evening. Jobs. Nice to see you here again. First, like, I'd like to congratulate on your delivery. You are phenomenal on delivery of speeches, uh, unlike anybody else. I have a two-part question. Both parts are unrelated. Firstly, I would like uh, you to explain the audience. We had a discussion many months ago. The issue of the, this everybody talks about actually originates on uh, the Sikhs trying to find justice in there. And you explained me very nicely once how the justice is delayed, but it is coming. Because they don't see that justice, they are trying to fight for that justice. So uh, I was impressed on your answer on that. The second link is, so if you can just describe to the others what it was. Uh, the other issue is uh, the adulteration of uh, drugs, milk, and food, what is the government doing there? We hear so much cancer, so many other issues coming out of total adulteration of everything, including milk and all materials, everything is adulterated. In India? Yeah. In India. No. First, I'm okay. The first time I'm here. Uh, maybe, I mean, uh, there are very strict laws against uh, any kind of adulteration, and uh, I'm sure the. Okay. If there are certain so, cases which come to light, uh, uh, law takes its course. I will hold the uh, question, then I will okay. pull out some data and send okay. it to you. Maybe then you can answer that question later on. Okay, but let me address the first part of your question, the issue of 1984, because this is a question that, you know, right. since in my eight and a half months that I have been here has come up many times. And I'm glad that I have this opportunity to take this question head on. Because the feeling among large sections of the Sikh community here is that what happened in 1984, everybody has got scot-free, nobody has been arrested, no prosecution has been done, everything has been brushed under the carpet, and the killers are roaming free, no justice has been uh, given. Nothing could be farther from the truth. It was probably one of the biggest blots in the history of India, no doubt about that. Prime Minister Manmohan Singh tendered an official apology uh, for that also in the Indian Parliament. But coming to the figures, facts and figures, you know, a total of 3,326 people died in the incidents of 1984. Out of that, 2,733 were killed in Delhi alone. And in Delhi, 3,174 persons were actually arrested. Full trial happened. And 442 people actually were sent to prison. Some even for life sentences. So this is the first point. 442 people are in jail or were in jail. They have, you know, uh, they have been convicted. They have, they have been, uh, they have been uh, given their punishment. In Haryana, 15 persons were convicted. In Uttarakhand, 178 persons were arrested and 10 were convicted. While in Himachal Pradesh, where only two uh, Sikhs died, 135 persons were arrested, 133 were persecuted, were prosecuted, and one was convicted. Also. Uh, 140 police officers were censured 
for what they did, and some of them were, were uh, even, uh, even jailed. A number of commissions of inquiry were appointed, but then, you know, the feeling still was that we still have not come to the bottom of it. So the government decided to constitute a special investigation team. I personally went and met the inspector general in charge of that special investigation team. And you know, he told me something interesting. He said, sir, we have advertised in every newspaper. We have even brought out advertisements in Canada that any witnesses of 1984 come forward. We are ready to take forward your claims. We are ready to prosecute people if we get evidence. He says he did not get a single person to come forward. And that is why they've, you know, they re-examined all the cases and now they have recommended about 300 cases to be closed. The Supreme Court said no. We will not allow you to just close these cases. We want to confirm that indeed no evidence has been found and that is why you are closing these cases. So the Supreme Court appointed two retired judges of the Supreme Court to personally go into each of those cases to confirm and satisfy themselves that indeed nothing uh, more can be done and those cases can be closed. Mr. J Sajjan Kumar, Jagdish Teitler, you know, two of the individuals whose names are always uh, mentioned, they are not off the hook. No clean chit has been given to them. They are, in fact, the CBI is saying lie detector tests need to be given to them and they have to come and explain themselves to the courts that why they don't want to give the lie detector tests. Their passports are impounded, they cannot leave the country. The case is still going on, hearings are, are still going on. The next hearing was supposed to be yesterday, November 26. So anyone who says that, oh, everything has been brushed under the carpet, nothing has happened, it's all been forgotten, is complete, is, is talking through his hat. We ourselves are committed. I personally am committed. We must get justice for 1984. Who can ever say that 1984 uh, should just be forgotten and uh, we just, uh, you know, brush it under the carpet? There will be accountability. There will be justice. As I said, justice has been done in a large number of cases and justice still continues to be done. The Supreme Court, the High Courts, everybody is personally involved in the case. So let no one think that nothing has been done. Sir. Yes, justice is slow. Thank you very much for sharing like, uh, a lot of things that you have explained out there. Exactly. How do you compare to the Excuse me. Let's not get into Ajit. it. No, no, please. Pankaj. Ah. Pankaj. Oh. oh. What happened? You asked for Your it. Excellency. Uh, I just wanted to say that um, in context of India, what we are discussing, the, every part of the world has seen the classes, different classes. It has been always in some point of time in history. But in India, it became something totally different, the casteism. And um, I was just a bit concerned about that. With the rise of India and with the technological advancement, actually the issue had been diluting, but a very much lethal combination of technology <laughs> And the old evil of casteism is taking place right now. And I think it's going to be the great challenge for the rulers, current rulers, as well as the future rulers of India. And how India can counter this uh, very great challenge coming forward. Yeah. Look, that's also a very good point. I thought whether I should include that in my slide presentation or not. Uh, eventually, I thought I'll address it in the q and I'm glad you raised that because you know, sometimes many people say that India is also defined by the caste system, which is something which has been present for, for millennia. The good news is that the caste system is on its last legs as far as economics is concerned. You know, when you hire somebody in India, you don't even ask the caste. When you're traveling in the Delhi metro, you don't know the person who the person sitting next to you is. Untouchability has been officially banned, as you know, in the constitution of India itself. Uh, anyone who practices untouchability I think minimum punishment is 10 years. Yes, caste has survived as a social construct and as a political construct. As a social construct, you can understand why caste has survived. Do you know that 80% of marriages in India are still arranged marriages? So when the marriages are arranged, the father feels that, look, since I'm getting an arranged, uh, I'm going to do an arranged marriage, I might as well get a bride or a groom of the similar background as, uh, you know, as my son or my daughter. And that's why, you know, the arranged marriage takes place generally within the same caste. But of course, there also, if you look at so many matrimonial advertisements, the opening line is caste no bar, that they are ready to look beyond caste and beyond creed and, you know, uh, just India in general or even, even foreigners. So my sense is that economically, 
caste is more or less over. Uh, nobody bothers about your caste, uh, you know, in an economic environment. The only caste that matters is how well educated you are. In a social sense, only when more women join the workforce, when there is more intermingling of the sexes, I think gradually those barriers will break down. You will see more and more love marriages happening. And you know, love does not, as they said, love is blind. It does not look at caste and creed and things like that. Uh, then uh, that will go away. Politically, I really <laughs> you know, uh, cannot, cannot say because there was a transitory arrangement at one time even for reservation that it will be for 10 years, but then it has uh, kept on increasing. But one thing I would say that through the reservation system at least, we have affected the biggest social engineering in the history of the world. Today, 50% of all government jobs are reserved for the so-called historically disadvantaged castes. And you can imagine why, because you see, the caste system is not just a stigma, it also impacts you mentally. You know, that if you, I mean, try to put yourself in the shoe of someone who's from the lower caste. That, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of, the way people look at that person and all that. So I think Dr. Bhimrao Ambedkar really deserves the greatest recognition in the history of the world for recognizing that and for putting in institutional mechanisms so that that kind of a discrimination does not exist in a civilized society like India. And I think that was important, that now the so-called earlier disadvantaged castes are rulers in India, they are uh, the ones who are actually administrators of India. And gradually, I think, uh, you know, through this gradual seeping of economic prosperity to all, the, my sense is that the caste system will eventually wither away. Now you are seeing even the so-called forward castes wanting to be backwards so that they can take the advantage of reservation. <laughs> Sir, my question is straight to the Aadhaar card. Like, uh, Canadian citizen can directly apply Aadhaar card? No. I think uh, very recently new Aadhaar rules yeah, have that's come. Yeah, changed you something. Are, yes. If you are not obliged to have an Aadhaar card, you are not, uh, you don't need an Aadhaar card. It, Aadhaar card is prime. That's what I'm saying. It's only for residents. That's but, what I'm but I'm a non-resident, so I can't get other card? If, no, I if you are a non-resident, I mean, if you are ordinarily not, then you, if you have an Indian address, when you yeah, go to Yeah, that India, is what, I have OCI plus uh, Indian address, so I can apply other card. If you have an Indian address, Sir. then you can uh, technically speak And physically I have card, to be but there? Then, as I said, you will be committing a slight illegality because you will be showing that you are a resident of India when you are not a resident oh. of India. That's Sir, what I'm saying. if you don't mind, let's restrict these questions. Now, those questions can no, be addressed by the... Yeah, I think those kind of questions, uh, Dinesh is the right person on his weekly Please, tabar, uh, please <laughs> to, because to this is... Those. We have very little time and there are many important people. But All OCI of them want to ask questions. OCI, somebody yeah. has I to think ha simplify. let's leave housekeeping issues. Let's talk about more policy issues. I think please. that is uh, what uh, uh, I'm here for. Vipul, uh, this gentleman here in the front, he is getting annoyed at me in any way. <laughs> no, not huh. getting annoyed. I'm a little scared. Thank you. I just wanted a chance to talk. This is the only chance we get, probably. Your charismatic speech was very impressive, and I think everybody applauded you so many times. Thank you so much. But my question, my, my mother came a few years back, and when she went back, her grandkids asked, what did you see change in Canada and India? Can you compare this? Two things. What are those? Sachai or Safai? Mm. The kid was like, the kid Canada is very that's, clean. That's a good phrase. I'll use it in my next speech. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And she was very, very impressed with it. I think ordinary people who day to day life in Canada is very comfortable. Correct. And they're not only in lineups, but people's mentality hasn't changed yet. And it's changing. By the way, can you get to the question, uh, my, please? My question is: I went to India with my son; he looks whiter than me. And I went to visit Taj Mahal, and I bought the ticket. I said, "My son, ticket. Oh, he will have to pay thousand rupees." Correct. And I paid forty rupees. I said, "Why?" Because He's you look like an Indian, and he looks like an NRI. <laughs> so they immediately understood. No, he, <laughs> but I thought I was upset. It's fifteen dollars for me. Nothing much. But that discrimination it's in okay. my own country. Sir, you can. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm exactly. sorry. Technically, technically, See, you have gypped the Indian government of uh, you know 960 rupees. Can we can we get to the please? Because look, question next is, question. Why why they charge more from Canadians oh, than it's, Indians? Exactly because in yeah. Canada, when Indians come here, then for going to any place, the minimum charge will be ten dollars, fifteen dollars, twenty dollars for any of your attractions. Same here. price for everybody. No. Be, 
it exactly what i mean to say is that there is a indian price and there is the international price when indians go abroad we pay the international price so when internationals come to india they need to pay the international price that is the logic yes maybe it should not be there maybe it should not be that is a uh, that is a separate debate i don't think he As has any now, right to change the it. ticket pricing <laughs> exactly no. may i please <laughs> i mean the indian high commissioner has many powers but not this much please <laughs> we got three more questions please can you make it quick sure, sure. questions I am unlike the other people who are lecturing. I am not here to lecture. <laughs> Please. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, actually, I am in business, and here I observe that okay, you know, you know, in your presentation we saw that technology is changing the India, but my show me again. My observation that until the ethics and like is not changed by the people. it will not change here even though i don't want to criticize you know indian embassy here you know or consulate general but the people attitude is completely different you know even though they are here so my question to you apart from education what in india has to do like technology every can follow the developed countries you know okay technology it is known or tomorrow it will be invented so people can follow but what the government or indian government or here the people has to do to change their ethics and moral and attitude look i mean i am not going to believe that uh, people in india have deficient ethics or attitude i think uh, they are good people they are bad people in every society what is important is technology is allowing you to bypass people's ethics and attitudes now when you travel in india by plane you book your ticket online when you travel in india by Last train question. you book After your ticket that. online for 90% of services you don't even need to in, have an have an interface with any indian official or, or or the government even for going to visit india now you can apply a visa online where you do not see the face of the consulate official you do not see the face of the indian embassy official it goes from your computer directly to a computer in the ministry of home affairs approval comes directly to your computer print it out go to india so that is what is happening increasingly we are using technology to cut through the bureaucracy we are using technology to because you know individuals have their own preferences and their own mindsets technology is the same for everyone and look at the way our foreign affairs minister external affairs minister sushma swaraj is using technology look at how she has used twitter okay. twitter now we have made as a means of grievance redressal in the past kya hota tha you know you had a problem now you are approaching the chaprasi is not going to allow you to meet somebody else you know you cannot go no sir saab is busy no can go you go to the next guy saab chai pe gaye you cannot meet uh, approaching the minister is impossible you can't even approach the joint the deputy secretary forget the minister now you just tweet today i went to the indian embassy in ottawa i was treated rudely next day my job is gone <laughs> you know this is the change that has come that people are now cognizant that the minister can directly reach out to them minister can hear them directly again use of technology just one or two more questions okay gupta ji please 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 sit down please don't be please okay uh, first there is a line up yeah. i have to follow that please uh, good day sir uh, i really learned so much from your speech today i am rakesh modi ayurvedic practitioner here and uh, i was looking to the future technology which is going to be based on sanskrit okay. and in india we are losing out the sanskrit because the future technology in, uh, the artificial intelligence will be built only the language fit for is sanskrit and we are as per the report of india we are losing the sanskrit scholars not under this government more and more sanskrit institutes are now coming up sanskrit courses have been introduced in several universities now so that charge you certainly cannot level against the current government and in europe there is more 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 and more curriculums are adding the sanskrit and we are losing that so that kind of shame and uh, sanskrit is a pioneer of many language and many technologies as ayurvedic practice no i agree with you in fact the world acknowledges that sanskrit is the most logical language in the world there is no doubt and that's why it's the mother language for so many indo european languages you know sanskrit was the base so my sense is that uh, sanskrit uh, will continue to thrive in india eventually uh, you know for any language to survive and thrive you need an ecosystem if the ecosystem is not there then the language eventually you know shrinks and then it becomes a dead language this is what happened to latin for instance i think sanskrit the ecosystem is still very much there under this government we are enlarging that ecosystem so that more and more people can uh, you know can speak in sanskrit can 
uh, learn the original text in Sanskrit uh, directly rather than in a, in a translation form. So my sense is that your uh, concerns are valid, but uh, you know, let's not overblow it. Uh, this government is cognizant of this. So I got three more questions. Oh my God, okay. Three more. Okay. Mr. Karamjit. Sir, my name is uh, Karamjit Singh Mal. I'm chairman of Haryana Sports and Culture Club of Canada. And I've been holding this job over, over a decade or so now. We celebrate Haryana Day every year, first week of November. I'm thankful to Honorable Bhatia ji, he was our chief guest this year. I, I don't have a question, but I want to answer this gentleman who was talking something about consulate. I live in a community. I have not got any complaint, not even a single complaint, against Indian consulate here <laughs> over last four times. Ye mein likke affidavit de sakna, angutha bhi la sakna. Very good. Great. So, ee jadi tawadi complain hai ki ko tawada personal matter ho na, odli ho sakadi ye, but yeah, according yeah. to their administration, there's nothing. They, they are doing really good Thank and you. everything is going. Thank you, Karamjit ji. Thank you. Thank you. Can I please that. have the microphone going to Anu? Good evening, Your Excellency. My name is Anu Vittal. I want to commend you on a very eloquent delivery of a beautiful Indian story. Um, my question to you is with regards to art and culture. Uh, in Canada, the creative industries, art and culture contributes $54.6 billion to the economy. And as you know, in India, art and craft is the second largest contributor to the GDP after agriculture. So what can we do uh, between Canada and India in this corridor of creative industries and culture. The first thing that comes to mind, Anu, is to exploit the India-Canada co-production agreement on films. Uh, you know, we have this agreement for the last 10 years or so, but we have not yet exploited it. Not a single co-production has been made between India and Canada. Many Indian films have been shot in Canada. Many Punjabi films continue to be shot in and around Toronto. But we have not really done uh, a service to this agreement by really shooting a, a film which has elements of both India and Canada and which can be a joint effort for both countries. So I think that is one thing that comes to mind immediately. The other thing I think we need to learn from Canada is conservation. You know, the way Canadian libraries and uh, institutions and museums uh, have been maintained, uh, the kind of acquisitions they make. Unfortunately, culture in India, because we, I mean, at the end of the day, we are still a poor country. We, we do not have the luxury of spending as much on culture. You know, some countries spend five to 6% of the GDP on culture. We don't have that luxury. Only when we become a developed economy can you know, more uh, money come for culture. But despite those, uh, you know, those bottlenecks and those, uh, and those deficiencies, I think Indian artists continue to excel. If you look at the latest Christie and uh, Sotheby's auctions, Indian art continues to sell very, very well. I think Indian, many Canadian investors have also now invested in Indian art. So I am very hopeful. You know, India, because, as I said, it's the world's largest democracy, millions of flowers continue to bloom. Indian creativity is something that can never be constrained. I mean, Jugaad is one example of that. But uh, <laughs> art uh, is something where it finds uh, almost immediately uh, that, you know, it can bloom. You just need a canvas uh, and, and you can start painting. So I am personally very hopeful that uh, more and more uh, Indian cultural efflorescence will, will come to the fore and that Canada can be a good partner for us in bringing uh, you know, a joint culture in a way together. Uh, just for your information, Canada was the partner country at the India International Film Festival in Goa, uh, which has just concluded. And uh, about nine Canadian films were showcased there. Uh, top Canadian directors like Atom, uh, Egoyan, etc., uh, went there. So this shows that the two countries are looking at each other from a lens of culture as well. Thank you. Gentlemen. I'm Vinod Munshi, past president of IIT Alumni Canada. I was watching NDTV today and there was a debate, uh, Vikas Kahan Gaya. So I thought I'll attend this event and find out for myself. <laughs> you know, your speech was so inspirational and a lot of it even we, uh, and I would call ourselves intellectuals, don't know. So my suggestion is maybe you can, uh, you know, broadcast this on ATN for a million Indo-Canadian to know this, 
so that they can propagate to the rest of the Canadian population. We are going to take care of that, Look, sir. We don't need ATN. 1.2 million Indo-Canadians are already here, who, as I said, are our permanent ambassadors. So, yes, I mean, now it's like training of trainers. I have told you what is happening in India. You tell your circle, and that circle tells come, come. their circle. That's how the story of India will get broad based. Maybe. That's how more and more people will come to, come to appreciate the tremendous transformation that is underway in India right, right now. So, before okay. I ask my question, I, oh, the question is not okay. over? No, no, a, a quick one. Uh, quick one. I would like to Dinesh appreciate... Dinesh says he will speak to ATN also. I will appreciate uh, Mr. Dinesh Bhatia, the way he has engaged diaspora and, you know, give, given us great service and support, particularly for industry and business. And the question is, uh, China grew on industrial revolution uh, by getting manufacturing activity there. What do you foresee uh, the growth catalyst for India? Look, first of all, you have to recognize China's industrial revolution. I mean, China's opening up started in 1978. Ours started in 1991. So China had a good 15-year head start uh, over us. That's the first thing. The second thing is, this government is very committed, you know, the Make in India program, where we want to increase the share of manufacturing from the current 15 to 16% to 25% in the next 10 years. But many people have also started saying that the age of low-cost manufacturing may be over. I mean, one expert was telling me that the moment uh, wages go above $30 per hour, it makes no sense to uh, manufacture through the traditional way, then you install robotics. So I think the, the two big waves that are coming, I think, are going to be AI and blockchain. These are the two things that will drive the 21st century economy in the future. And we need to get onto that bandwagon very <coughs> early on. If we do not get onto blockchain and AI, I think we'll lose out. China is making massive investments in cybernetics, in machine learning, AI, all these things in blockchain. Already, uh, Baidu and others, uh, Tencent, etc., are leading the way in e-commerce. Forty percent of global e-commerce is happening in China. I think we need to learn from China. And we also need to make these strategic investments in these future technologies so that we become future-proof. The last question, please, Karan Sumeshwar. Oh. Maybe you want to murder him too, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I've got many candidates now. <laughs> so my name is Karan Someshwar, Your Excellency Uncle Vakas. Um, I am uh, the son of the man that you want to murder. Okay. So I believe that you are second in line. Uh, my mother is first in line, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I thought your speech was amazing, phenomenal, uh, very informative. Uh, but I, you use the word jugad, so I want to throw another word back at you. It's called hutke, and that is my question this today. I want to give you a little bit of a hutke question because I'm a Bollywood okay. fan. Right. I know uh, Sandeep Uncle is a Bollywood fan, and my mother definitely. You can't pull her off of those soap operas. So <laughs> my question to you, um, and first I want to say this about CIF. Uh, this was an amazing event. Make right? it quick. It was phenomenal. Anil Uncle, you are the best. You know this. Already. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and, and please keep on coming to the speaker series because they are phenomenal. They get better and better. Yes, every, please. Every get day. registered for so, the next one. So everybody, please get registered. Uh, my pitch. But going on, I wanted to ask you, uh, what was your inspiration for Q&A? It's a phenomenal book. This is indeed a hard question. Yes, it is a hard <laughs> question because we all know, as a, as a first generation, Indo-Canadian, India is where my heart lies, but I was born in London, brought up in Canada, truly Indian. Um, my question to you is, what was your inspiration for Q&A? Did it have anything to do with India's transformation through the years, from the rags to riches? That is my question to you. Well, I'll be answering that question in detail next year when I'm coming to University of Toronto, I think on the 4th of April. I'm actually doing a one-day event with them, and they are also screening Slumdog Millionaire. But I'm sure you can't wait till April, uh, because the young are restless. So, uh, <laughs> look, uh, for me, the main thing I wanted to show through the, through the book, uh, which I wrote, was that do not disparage someone just because they have not had the luxury of a decent education. We spoke about the education system in India. And in India, we have this tendency. Those of us who go to convent schools or you know, uh, proper schools, those of us who read English newspapers, go to universities, we think, oh, we are the know-it-alls. And those who have not had the luxury or the good fortune of getting a decent education, the maids, the gardeners, the sweepers, the cleaners, you know, what do we say? Gadha hai. You know, idiot. 
know, that doesn't know anything. We, that's, that's our general attitude towards them. And I have been always tremendously impressed by the amount of wisdom and common sense these ordinary folk possess, which of course, they show very well to the politicians on the day of the voting also, you know, by, by throwing governments out. So I wanted to show through Q&A that the greatest teacher in the world is life itself. And those who graduate from the school of hard knocks, they know that every moment in life is meaningful and significant. And because they have graduated from this school, they have street knowledge as opposed to book knowledge. And sometimes street knowledge can be as useful to you as book knowledge. This is not to say that do not get an education, but those who have not had an education also have knowledge. That is the, that is the Fantastic. Point. Ladies and gentlemen, may I please ask uh, all the CIF members and Mr. Consul General, Mr. Bhatia to come up here, please. Yeah, I think the question answers are all. Let's give a big hand and a token of appreciation for the high commission.